How are you supposed to protect against APTs? Against the type of threat that, by definition, is most difficult to protect against? That's what we'll try to answer today. My name is Robert Lipovsky, and I'm a senior malware researcher for ESET, a leading cybersecurity vendor from Europe, a pioneer in proactive malware detection, in the business of protecting users for over 30 years now. As for my role, I've been doing cybersecurity research for 12 years now. Currently, I lead the research team in ESET's HQ in Slovakia, and I also teach reverse engineering to university students. These types of headlines catch our attention. And at the same time, we work to ensure that organizations we're responsible for protecting won't feature as a victim. There's been a lot of theoretical debate about the differences between full-fledged APTs, attacks that are targeted but not necessarily advanced, and mere data breaches that are, in fact, often the result of those attacks. A more important differentiation, though, is whether a threat is opportunistic, such as most crimeware, or if it's targeted, and in those types of attacks, more often than not, it's also persistent. So I think we can all agree that those are the types of threats that we're concerned with the most, that are the most difficult to protect against, and that's regardless whether you're protecting a government organization, a Fortune 500 company, or a critical infrastructure asset. What's important is that, as someone responsible for security in your organization, you don't overly rely on popular marketing buzzwords because, spoiler alert, there are no silver bullets. We advocate that a multi-layered security stack is not just the most effective, but also the only viable approach for any reasonable level of security. Here's an overview of the various ESET detection layers capable of detecting threats either pre-execution, during execution, or post-execution. Now let's take a look at how this comes into play in an APT attack. I'll walk you through four APT attack scenarios based on real-life attacks we've analyzed. The various attacker techniques will be mapped to the MITRE attack knowledge base, along with the possible ways to detect them on multiple layers using endpoint security and EDR solutions. The most commonly used attack vector in APTs is still compromised via email. Here we see the attacker crafting a malicious email. They attach a malicious attachment to it. That attachment can contain a malicious macro, for example. And the email is sent to the intended target. It lands on the mail server, and the system administrator can see in their console that it was sent for inspection to the ESET Dynamic Threat Defense Cloud Sandbox, which also employs machine learning classification models. No matter how heavily protected or obfuscated that malware sample is, when it's executed in the Cloud Sandbox, it's decloaked and its malicious functionality revealed. The malware is stripped from the email, which is then sent to the intended recipient with a message informing them that the malware has been removed. All of this is also visible to the administrator in ESET Security Management Center with all the necessary details. Here the admin can view a report documenting the full malware behavior. This was generated during its execution in the Cloud Sandbox. Even though the infection attempt was blocked by ESET, the attacker is persistent and tries again to infect the company environment, this time using infected USB drives. An unsuspecting employee picks up an infected USB stick, plugs it into their computer, but fortunately isn't able to access the files because unauthorized USB devices are blocked in this company environment by ESET device control. This is the system admin's console view in ESET Security Management Center. They can also see that the USB device was blocked on one of the workstations in the network. Although each of these protective layers would be able to stop the attack, 
For the sake of this demonstration, we'll show what the malware would do if any particular layer had not blocked it. So if device control was not set up, the user would be able to access the files on that USB stick. The attacker has, again, planted a document with an exploit on it. He said would detect it using a DNA detection. Here we can see the specific RTF exploit that the attacker used. If we allow the threat to run past the DNA detection, it would be detected by ESET Exploit Blocker, a detection layer designed to detect exploit generically, even zero days. If ESET Exploit Blocker was not in place, the thread would execute and try to connect to its command and control server in order to download the next stages. This attempt would be blocked by ESET's web access protection layer. If it weren't for web access protection, the malware would continue to run and the first thing it would try to do is elevate its privileges and then establish persistence. This is a typical step for malware. Once they get in, they want to make sure they stay on the system. We can also see the malware behavior in our EDR solution, ESET Enterprise Inspector. Here's the detailed view where we can see the process tree. Microsoft Word executed a PowerShell, which then launched the main malware component, WXE, in the temp folder. It then tried to bypass user account control using a file association modification technique. In the next tab, we see the process already running with elevated privileges, signified by the red mark, and that it gained persistence by setting an auto start entry in Windows registry. Afterwards, the malware would talk to its CNC server again to get commands. This communication is intercepted and blocked by the botnet protection layer. Further details are visible in the administrator's console along with the computer name and the source and destination IP addresses and ports of the attempted botnet communication. If the botnet protection layer hadn't blocked that communication, the malware would download additional components. The first component, which we've seen attackers use for network reconnaissance before lateral movement, is Nmap. Now, Nmap is a legitimate tool, in this case abused by the attacker, so as such it doesn't trigger a DNA detection by default. But the network scan is visible in ESET Enterprise Inspector. If we click to see the details, we can see the network addresses and ports being scanned. Afterwards, the malware would download a second component, the infamous Mimikatz tool used to extract Windows credentials. This is detected by a DNA detection in ESET's advanced memory scanner. So again, all the intrusion attempts would have been blocked by the various detection layers, but let's say the attacker discovered that the target company's web server is vulnerable and makes another attempt to compromise the network this way. The attempt to exploit that web server vulnerability is detected by ESET Network Attack Protection. By the way, this was the layer that successfully protected ESET users from the WannaCry and NotPetya outbreaks. 
If network attack protection was not in place, the malware would launch its payloads through a PowerShell script. Via SSH, it would copy ransomware onto the MacBook in the network. And this would be detected by ESET endpoint antivirus for macOS. Likewise, the script would attempt to launch ransomware on other Windows computers via PSExec. If it hadn't been caught by a DNA detection, it would be blocked by the layer dedicated to detecting ransomware, ESET Ransomware Shield. All of this activity is also visible in ESET Enterprise Inspector. Here we can see the exploitation of the Apache vulnerability, PowerShell, execution of PSExec, and the file coder ransomware behavior. Let's say the attacker was so advanced, they managed to deploy a UFI rootkit. That's more a persistence mechanism rather than a primary infection vector. It would provide an effective reinfection vector, so if later stages of the infection were discovered and removed, the threat would keep on returning, making it difficult to eradicate without the necessary detection capability. Last year, we discovered the first UFI rootkit being used in the wild. This is a big deal for two main reasons. Firstly, it's an extremely powerful persistence mechanism. And secondly, it's been used by one of the most infamous APT groups in operation today. Let's take a closer look at this significant discovery. The inspiration for the LoJack malware comes from a legitimate piece of software called LoJack. LoJack, previously known as CompuTrace, is an anti-theft solution by Absolute Software that comes pre-installed on laptops by many different vendors. It has the functionality you would expect from an anti-theft solution, such as being able to locate, lock, and remotely wipe your device. But what makes it particularly interesting is its persistence mechanism. Built into the BIOS or firmware during the manufacturing process of most major device manufacturers, we are able to provide our customers with the only security solution that can withstand a factory reset, installation of a new OS, or even a complete hard drive replacement, their website stated. Here's a technical overview of how LoJack ensures its persistence. First, the UFI module, which comes pre-installed. It's executed when the computer is powered on, but before Windows starts. It will copy a simple downloader called the small agent onto the Windows partition. When Windows starts, the small agent is launched and connects to a remote server to download the full agent and executes it. The full agent is the component that contains the implementation of all the LoJack anti-theft features. The powerful persistence mechanism makes perfect sense for an anti-theft solution, but it would also be very useful for an attacker, which is what happened. There was a vulnerability in an older version of the LoJack small agent. Its configuration file, which you can see here, contains the domain where it goes to download the full agent. The problem is that attackers were able to simply replace this domain name with a malicious one, effectively transforming a legitimate persistent anti-theft tool into a very malicious, very persistent backdoor. We detect this trojanized small agent as Win32 slash Lojax. Naturally, we were interested in finding out if the attackers went further and also compromised the previous stages all the way to the UFI. The answer was yes. We discovered that the UFI rootkit was deployed in an APT campaign against government and diplomatic organizations in Europe. Although the implementation was far from trivial, its functionality was pretty straightforward. After the computer was powered on, the rootkit was triggered. First, it would load the NTFS driver to allow read and write operations. This is a necessary step as Windows hasn't loaded yet. Afterwards, the rootkit writes the user land LoJack small agent to the file system and ensures its execution by patching the Windows registry. Apart from the rootkit itself, we discovered tools used to install it, 
by writing into the UEFI firmware memory. Perhaps most interestingly, we were able to attribute this attack to the infamous Sednet APT group, also known as Fancy Bear or APT28. The very same group that, among many other geopolitically motivated attacks, is reportedly responsible for the Democratic National Committee hack that affected the US 2016 elections. So, UFI rootkits are no longer merely a theoretical or proof of concept threat. They have been deployed against high profile targets, but even if you're not a diplomat or government employee, we can expect that this type of malware can be used by any dedicated attacker against any organization worth the effort. Detecting a UFI rootkit is not a trivial task. We have discovered the first UFI rootkit in the wild thanks to our dedicated UFI scanner, another important layer in the multi-layered security stack. So let's wrap up with some takeaways. As any honest vendor will tell you, there is no 100% security. And in order to maximize your level of defense, you really need to implement multiple security layers. Whether we like to admit it or not, the battlefield is uneven. Defenders need to cover all bases, while an attacker typically needs to find a single way of entry. Hence, a multi-layer approach is necessary. Furthermore, advanced attackers test their malware against anti-malware solutions before deployment. This is where endpoint detection and response solutions like ESET Enterprise Inspector come in handy. A few additional takeaways based on those previous points. While an AV scanner is an essential part of an endpoint protection platform, we know that single-purpose solutions are simply not enough to protect against today's advanced threats. We've seen that attackers increasingly employ post-exploitation tools, abuse legitimate software, and carry out supply chain attacks. To fight these threats in an enterprise, employing EDR together with services of a security operations center is a must. Another crucial investment in people, aside from a SOC, is regular education of all employees. This can't be repeated enough. Attackers exploit human vulnerabilities much more than they use advanced technical exploits, and this is unlikely to change anytime soon. And of course, the standard security recommendations still apply, things like two-factor authentication, backup management, patch management, and so on. Yes, ESET network attack protection has saved thousands of users from getting hit by the most devastating ransomware in history, even if they neglected to patch their systems. But that doesn't mean it's good practice to rely on that. In other words, to use reliable security solutions as an excuse for poor security hygiene. Our today's presentation focused on the necessity of a multi-layered approach in an endpoint protection platform. But actually, we also need to extend this principle further, securing your endpoints, securing your network, and securing your people. Thanks for watching.